Welcome to the Farcast here at Shattern State College. I'm coming at you from behind a little light bulb. Daniel Binkert here with Alex Helmbrecht, my co-host, and we're talking to Travis Hensey today, at the who's a teacher at the Shadron. I got to check this Shadron High School. Correct. Are you also teaching at any other of the other schools here? Not anymore. Okay. As of this year, I'm full time at the high school. Okay. So we hired somebody to take over the elementary for first time ever elementary art and then middle school. All right. Good. I wanted to double check because I seem to remember. Uh, yeah. Uh, Travis, tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you decide you wanted to be an art teacher? Uh, so born and raised here in Shadron. And so when I graduated high school, I went to the next logical spot across 10th Street. Sure. sure. Got an art degree. And at the time, if you asked me if I wanted to be an art teacher, you know, have the backup job plan, I would have said never. In fact, Miss Moore, my art teacher in high school, said that I was one day going to take her job. And I said, never, oh, not, yeah. not going to do that. And so I n never had any interest in teaching or being in the classroom working with kids. Just was outside of my frame. Um, and it wasn't until working Upward Bound here at the college, oh, yeah. I just needed some extra money. So I did a part-time gig doing their summer program. And uh, I ended up really loving working with the kids. I found out um, I could do that same creative design work that I love so much when it comes to lesson planning. And um, it targeting it toward the the student was really fun for me. Yeah. So doing that for a couple summers, I ended up going back to Shattern State and got a teaching degree. Yeah. So how long did you help with uh, Upward Bound in teaching the art classes there? Uh, that was four years. I think I want to say my first year was in 2012. Okay. So I stopped two years ago. So yeah, four years, went to, became a real teacher and then did it for like two or three years while I was a professional teacher also in the summers. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you're also a professional artist and you've done some 2D. Trying to be. In, in 3D yeah. pieces. Uh, talk talk to us a little bit about um, what have you done in the past and, and what are you currently working on? Um, so in the past, I made a big shift out of college when I went into um, trying to make it. A lot of my stuff was really graphic and ex inspired by French kind of Art Nouveau styles, a lot of line-based design work. Um, and then I don't know why, but when I had to do my first show, me and Chance Welch, one of my best friends, he now lives up in Rapid City, um, we did this show and I didn't know what to make and I just started putting together paper, like getting old books and putting paper together. And I started falling in love with collaging and just intuitively working from the paper texture. And so now I have these like almost quilty scrap pieces of paper that are just cobbled together and then I yeah. draw on top of that. And they're usually landscape based and I did no landscapes in college. So it just came out of nowhere. And I think that's when I started to find my love for the area. And that's what I'm trying to talk about is growing up here, staying here and that cycle of history and family that goes on when you stay here. You know, these stories of places in this area and those stories are older than you are. You know, your grandpa talks about that hill when he was a kid yeah. and you know that story as part of your own story. So that's what I'm trying to explore. Great. Um, and then I well, actually had some pretty good success with that. Um, and I was almost went to grad school in Fort Hayes. Uh, and then last minute, Probably mostly on gut, but also because my housing fell through, I just ditched out and then traveled a bit more um, and then tried to just see if I could make the art thing run on my own um, and did some, like they do these juried shows all around the country and you'd submit online and I made it into a couple and I made, made it one in Omaha at the Fred Simon Gallery. And that was like the perfect space for my art. They have these really cool stone walls and my paper was all old and you know, falling apart. So I had this really nice textural um, analogy to each other. It's really great. Is, Very nice. Is your art on display anywhere in the region that people could yeah, see? Or do so you have a website? I have a website, travishensey.com. Pretty easy. Um, and also Chance Welchel. He has a gallery up in Rapid City. He frames a lot. He's the best framer up in Rapid yeah. City. And uh, he displays my work and it sells pretty good up there. So I'm going to keep sending him stuff. Um, I just sent him two pieces this Saturday to frame. Um, and he has shows going on right now. He's got a painter up there, Tom Thorson, I want to say. Okay. You can check out, but yeah. Cool. So what does the future hold for artwork for you? Are there any styles or techniques you'd like to explore over, say, the next five or ten years? 
any bucket list items? Yeah. So when I was wondering before I made the teacher jump, I was wondering what, how to make this art thing work and what to do with my life. And I went down a rabbit hole of metal point drawing. So actually drawing with silver wire. Right. And I never quite integrated it into my actual art practice. It's always just been a thing I've played with. And so just recently, I finally did a silver point drawing that I'm going to exhibit. And we'll see how it goes. But it's, it, it's interesting, me, interesting to me. I talk about like time and memory. And that okay. silver point, it tarnishes over time. It turns brown and transparent, which I, as a material, I really like that. It pulls into the essence of the theme. Hmm. Oh, yeah, seeing that patina on things yeah. as that forms. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that. Are those the same? Has Don Rouleau, Rouleau yeah. done that before? Absolutely. Want, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. That was, that's the one where you can end up with really, really fine detail yeah. in the lines. I uh, was in Sioux City at uh, um, this place. They have a bunch of artists that share a space and work out of, and there was one of the artists had had that on, on the wall. And I just, you know, you can look closer and closer and closer and still yeah. see more detail if the artist has done that yeah. it's just fantastic and you can work up those layers kind of like oil painting and glazes you can do that with drawing draw a couple layers let it tarnish and become transparent and then draw new layers on oh great it's that cool effect yeah yeah that's interesting well, well, Travis, you've mentioned teaching a, a couple different times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got a few years under your belt. What's that experience been like? You know, talk about it. Oh, it's it's a roller coaster. So I did my student teaching up in Rapid City, and I felt extremely prepared to take on. I just like boosted my confidence. I can take on this full time, no problem. Um, first teaching gig, that was not true anymore. All my experience was with middle school and high school, and then my first classes that I taught as a full-time teacher were kindergartners and first graders. Oh, yeah. So that would, there went the plans, you know. <laughs> there I'm trying to think on my feet and didn't have much practice doing that. Um, high school, I did pretty good, and um, middle school was okay. Um, so it's just been a learning process, kind of carving down what I think are the plans that work and then tossing the ones that don't. And so now I'm... At Shadron, this is my third year, and I think I'm to the point where I need to start complicating things again because of what I've done and used is working well enough that I can, you know, test myself and challenge myself again. What What are some of the things that you that you teach the students? I'm trying to think back to my high school art class, and it was like vanishing point things, and oh gosh, how do you maybe screen printing? How do you take like composition principles that would apply to say a high school audience? and boil it down for a elementary audience or is because i'm drawing the same blank i think that you are i yeah. can't remember art classes yeah. in elementary school <laughs> you complicated question. These, like, memories coming to oh, me yeah. of trying to do these things and well we're trying something new now. sure we're drawing perspective <laughs> yeah. boxes today um I th- like kindergarten and first grade is mostly about just discovery discovering how to use the materials mm-hmm. and that goes in ways that will surprise a new teacher. So one that comes into mind is I was teaching them how to use charcoal to draw. And I turn to help a student and I turn back around and three of my students, I don't know where they got the water from, but they had discovered that you can mix water in charcoal (laughs) and then it makes a pretty strong paint. And they were literally covered from fingertip up to their elbows in black. (laughs) And like, okay, I guess we're just going to go with it. We're going to learn how to use wet charcoal. And so I, I, talking about composition, I think, is a little too um, right. what, cerebral, I guess. I don't know. It's a good point, yeah. yeah too we abstract for them. Learn mm-hmm. the materials yeah. first. And, and young artists, they're pretty good at composing images anyway. Just like, give me something to mark make with, and I'm going to yeah. give you a picture, and I'm going to tell you three different stories from this one picture, you know, that's pretty fun. So they're way stronger visual communicators than my high school students are just partly because being told that writing and talking is the right language to use versus drawing could be. So that comes into when I teach my intro classes at high school right now, I'm just trying to build that confidence um, with visual communication. How can you feel okay just drawing a person and telling a story with that. 
Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like rediscovery when it comes to the high school level. Uh, Travis, what are some of the other ways you engage with your students during class? And uh, we also have a note about you're, you're a student council advisor. How does that kind of thing tie into um, working with your students? So as a student council advisor, we're, what I'm trying to do now is just make it a thing because I was in student council as a kid and it was just like concessions. That's what you did. Okay. You wrote it on your college resume and scholarship resume and uh, yeah. you were on student council and you just made popcorn. Um, so now we're trying to make it an actual um, event causing committee. So. The kids are generating different beyond dances. What are we doing? We started doing halftime shows, new interesting ways to raise money that people actually want. And so that's yeah. fun to get the students generating ideas, which is something I do in my classroom. How do we generate new ideas that have value to our community? Yeah. Great. Um, and so while I'm at it, I don't get paid for these, but I've also started a meme team at Shadron. So it just takes a very ironic look at high school clubs in general. Um, for instance, we don't have a president. We have a self-appointed supreme leader. <laughs> and he just makes demands upon his subjects. Um, and that's morphed into like a Dungeons and Dragons club too. And then we have an anime club that they're really gung-ho. Yeah. They really want to go to Comic-Con as a group. And they're oh, yeah, like, there you go. I'm all hands off with that. I just watch and kind of facilitate, but they're they're making some moves to make that happen. It's pretty exciting. How many students are involved in these groups? So in the meme team, and I think they like it this way, it's like maybe three. And <laughs> those three are related. So it's fine. Um, in the meme or the anime club, there's reliably 10 students that show up, sometimes more, sometimes oh, that's less. Great. A lot of them are in, also in speech, and the speech has a lot of requirements as far as practice goes. And so they have to get excused from speech to come down. To anime club, but that's awesome. Well, any I mean anything to give those students some type of outlet yeah. or, or a sense of community that's huge. Yeah, and and to have that community in the school because online you can find community anywhere. Just, mm -hmm. But to get that outside of your bedroom and outside your device, yeah, so think, nice to have face to face. Yeah, valuable. Yeah, I didn't have that. I was a weird kid in high school and liking anime i would have just been by myself you know so to have a room full of 10 other students yeah. that liked it and we could talk about it that's pretty cool yeah oh, absolutely definitely. uh so another community in shattern is the music community and, and you're mm -hmm. also involved uh with that in addition to being an artist uh talk a little bit about your time as a musician so i played bass guitar since i was 15 um sean marie dillinger was our was my guitar teacher, bass guitar teacher, um, she taught like half the town how to play guitar or fiddle. Um, and the way Sean taught was she wanted you to learn how to play so you'd actually go and play songs in front of people. She wanted you to be able to jam and that's what she gave me. And so starting at 15, we were playing in the gazebo at Earth Day and things like that. And that morphed into starting bands when you're 16 with your friends in a garage. Um, then going even more serious in college. We had a band called Emblem Exits with Kent Kelso, who used to work here, um, Alex Keller, who's now a mailman in Shadron. Um, we played pretty seriously for three years while being college students. Uh, we're kind of signed. We had a three-song demo that we put out ourselves, but then stamped our friend Marty Lastovic as a record label on it, so we called that being signed. Right. That counts. That works. Yeah. Uh, and then... That, those were in the heydays of Javon Mays when he was doing the open mic, yeah. which we're trying to keep going. It's nothing like it was back in those days. Like you might get 15 people in the audience. But, mm -hmm. So we're, me and Sean and some other community members, especially older community members, which I think is fun, they're musicians. They're coming in, like Don Folk is coming in, plays ukulele, and does really nice songs. And yeah, it's, it's just nice on a Wednesday night. Um, middle of the week, have a nice little break and listen to some, some of your friends play, even if they're the same song every week, just to get out and, you know, connect at a musical level. All right. And where are those open mics usually? Is it the Bean Broker? Bean Broker, yeah. We're supposed to start at 7, but the way Sean and I manage our time, it's usually we start setting up at 7.30 and then we're playing music by 8. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, geez, sometimes they'll go till, like, they're kicking us out. Because high school kids have started showing up with their bands. It's pretty fun. So 
I think we're starting to get a new music scene. I don't know if we'll ever get it back to the heyday where the, it was standing room only in there, but what we're trying. And, and what type of music is being played? Mostly folky stuff, um, country. You get the, the student, a like college student or high school student that just got a ukulele for Christmas and they're doing like Jack johnson sort of stuff. So, sure. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, so, Travis, kind of a double-sided question for you here. Inspirations, both on the art side and the music side. Who, who are a few people that that you look up to or have, have um, shaped the work that you're doing now? So, I think when I talk about it, I made that shift after college you know, just thematically. I think Andrew Wyeth was the number one just the texture and his thoughtfulness with the material and putting in the time every single day to just do it. I think looking at his pictures taught me a lot. Um, and he could just simply, just the grit and the depth of the texture in the scene and the story going on. Yeah. And still having this abstractness, like it's not just about the realism, which I feel like happens a lot when you're focused on technique. It's all about the realism and that looks like a cow, but there's something else going on abstractly in the concept in his work. Okay. So using both the technique and um, heavy on the concept and the story beyond talking about life in general, no matter who you are, I think. Andrew Wyeth is probably number one on the list. Okay. And then more contemporary and some Kiefer. He does super textural work. And like when I talk about the, my interest in patina and silver point, he uses lead a lot in a really like magical way. To him, that weight of lead has a symbolic meaning. Okay. So he uses it a lot. So I, the way he thinks about material is something I've started doing too. Uh, as a musician, I don't know, it's all over the place. Um, I was raised, or the reason why I guess I started playing bass was Blink-182. Me and my friends wanted to play in a band. One guy had drums, one guy had guitar, so I was left to be the Mark Hoppus and play bass, <laughs> which ended up good for me and I fell in love with it. So I guess poppy punk stuff um, will always be there. But then Getty Lee as a bass player who, their drummer, last week, no Pert, he died. But Getty Lee as a bass player is really influential on me. Okay. Now that's interesting. You mentioned uh, Blink-182. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget when I was in the hospital room waiting for my son to be born and my wife's in the bed. No one had slept and Good Morning America was on television and Blink-182 was yeah. playing on Good Morning America. Yeah. I remember talking to my brother and I was like, I'm officially old because yeah. Blink-182 is on Good Morning America. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We yeah. made it. <laughs> but, but for, and I'm a little bit older than you, but for guys of our age, like Blink-182 is definitely kind of that three-piece band that, yeah. that a lot of people who are interested in music really looked up to. Yeah, and I finally got to see them in Sturgis a couple of years ago. They played up in Sturgis and it was so disappointing. It was just the wrong venue for Blink-182 mm. there. Majority of people are not like 20-somethings, 30-somethings that listen to them in high school. These, you know, older bikers. And mm -hmm. so between each song, they do their revving thing. And Mark Office was like up there, okay, I guess we'll start the next song because we won't <laughs> do the stage banter that I used to love as a teenager. Right. They'd have that really vulgar stage banter that him and Tom DeLong would do back and forth and just couldn't do it because the motorcycles. <laughs> That's too bad. I was bummed, but whatever. That, that is unfortunate. <laughs> I, I have not had very good concert experiences in South Dakota. I don't know what no, really. it is. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Oh, well, nothing against the great state of South Dakota. No. <laughs> I've actually had some pretty good ones at the smaller venues, like a VFW and things like that, really intimate. You know, you have the random punk band that's trying to pick up another show on their way to Montana. Sure, or something. And sure. There's some really cool shows there. Um, Titus Andronicus I saw in there once. And just it, that was fun because it was like a two- um, room bar. There was one huge area for bingo and it was packed of like veterans and senior citizens yeah. doing <laughs> mad bingo. And then on the other side were all these hipsters and punks just like selling out all the Schlitz and PBR. And, <laughs> and it was awesome. And, and they, everyone got along. They had to yeah. order from the same bar, but everyone got along. And where was this? That was at the Tria, um, at, at Eastern end, like not quite the valley, but over there. Yeah. Huh. Titus Andronicus, a band you may like, Daniel. Um, check them out. The uh, 
they kind of mix art and music. Yeah. They have, um, I know they have one really great record called The Monitor about yeah. the Civil War oh, submarine. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and that was a tour they were yeah. promoting that album. Very album. interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so speaking of interesting, let's talk a little bit about this lamp from the Binkard Personal Collection. Yeah. Um, you made this. So, I did. Yeah, that's awesome that it's here. But how did this piece come together? What was your inspiration for it? Uh, is it part of a of a larger body of work or part of a series? It was a series, but more just a way to get myself out of a creative rut and like just give myself new problems to think about three-dimensionally with new materials. I've taken a lot materials-wise from that, like working with copper because it patinas, you know. But really what it started with is my mom told me one day at Sunday dinner, I want you to start making lamps. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would be yeah. cool if you use some of our old copper pipe because my parents, they have a plumbing shop here in town. So I have some copper pipe that they just let me use. And it's like, okay. And it took like three months before I actually started. And I was just grabbing blocks of wood that I found laying in the alley, cut them up into interesting forms and you know, laying materials out side by side and just eventually the, the design would come out. Um, so I ended up six or so lamps okay. I did. But mostly it was about just how do I use new things and try to make a product that does something. But most of my work is just flat. You just look at it, you know, it tells a story. But these had to have a purpose. They had to look nice. It's a completely different problem than when whatever I was trying to solve before. I'm always interested by that, and it, it, maybe you could talk on this too. Like when, when you take, because your your photos are like it's an image, and people see it, and I have one response to it, but you as the creator have a totally different response. And so, like hearing you talk about the idea came during an innocuous dinner with your family, and you have these, you know, this inventory of copper pipes at, at your mom and dad's business. It, it's really interesting to hear that backstory, but then also is there like um, like this is something you created, you worked time on, you, you put a lot of time into it. Is there a kind of a detachment from it now that you've created it and it's into its second life artistically? Do you, do you kind of see what oh, I'm saying? Oh, yeah, to? yeah. And I, I get that more from uh, the work I do here at the college because I'm creating a product that it has a certain purpose and it has a certain lifespan. And so you, I, I personally have to disconnect from it. Sure. That yeah, I'm, I still have you know the pride, the pride in the creation of it, um, the satisfaction that it's being used well. But at the same time, it doesn't have necessarily that personal connection. And it may be that a similar idea for this that this is almost like that idea of a commissioned work for you, right? Yeah. And so I, at the time, I was a designer. I did like logos and stuff, and so it is also thinking about the end user that you know yeah. em empathetic design thinking about how that user would use it and i don't have to, as an artist you don't necessarily have to do that mm -hmm. if you're really brash you could say it doesn't matter if my audience gets the message or not i'm doing I, it for I, me I, yeah <laughs> um, but as a designer you have to make that switch and consider how it's being received and so that's part of the problem for me uh when it comes to liking them after the fact and getting detached from them, I can't stand to look at stuff that I've done. So when I sell pieces, it's really good because the money, but also I can count on never having to see it again, likely. Um, when I have work that doesn't sell and it stays in my house, I usually end up destroying it and then iterating on it. So like those scraps will become, or that artwork will become scraps that I can then recobble in mm -hmm. it. So it's kind of like that. Um, a tablet, like a palimpsest that just keeps layering and layering, getting, building that history and that memory just through being worked on. Why, why do you think that is? That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes I wonder. So my parents' shop, we spent a lot of time there growing up. You know, my parents worked there. My grandparents had it before that. And um, great-grandparents had it before that. So there's a layering effect. And growing up there and just the way the place is built, like you can see layers of paneling and stuff and just whatever they had around in 1950 is what they made the walls out of. And then you think about it used to be a bar before that, and it's kind of shoved in between these buildings and I, that shop is really important to me for some reason. I made these lamps there um, and just looking around the space and seeing all the generations of people that have physically put that place together, even way before my family had anything to do with it. When the alley 
well, in the room that is the place we store some pipe and fittings for boilers and stuff, that used to be an alley between the buildings. Hmm. You can imagine, like, wow. in the frontier days, there's cowboys back there just, you know, hanging out. And, and now it's where we store stuff. So yeah. it's the layering there that I'm getting back into. I just love stories of the family, they, the same stories that get told every Thanksgiving. You know, you roll your eyes, you've heard it a thousand times, but they're still fun and interesting to listen to, especially when you know they're morphing every single year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? This living is, history. Yeah. <laughs> I do like the idea that, you know, as much as I hate to think, well, throw this piece of work out, even though you're not, you're recycling it. So yeah, that's a positive for yeah, sure. It never really goes away. Yeah. yeah. And I assume stories within stories within stories. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, so talking about kind of the history of the plumbing business here, but your connection with the community of Shatter, and you said you've grown up here. Mm -hmm stuck around what's the draw for Shadron for you I don't know if it's a draw I've been other places and I'm not drawn okay and when I'm here I feel right and there's qualities about places so I said I went to almost went to grad school in Fort Hayes and I was really impressed in the way that town which is about the size of Scotts Bluff embraced the arts like they had a biannual art event downtown where businesses would open up and artists could display their work. And I thought, this is really cool. I want to move here. And then as I was driving back, I came to the realization we could do that in Shadron. True. There's nothing that Fort Hayes is doing that, or nothing special about Fort Hayes that Shadron can also do. So then I just started to make the flip that if I feel right in Shadron, then I should just stay there and make the place what I would like it to be. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's inspiring. I like that. I like that. Small attitude. steps. I haven't, don't think oh, sure, I've made a huge sure. impact yet. So. Well, it takes time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of in that same vein about the arts and in, in, in a small town like Shattern, um, obviously there are the, the big tangible things like Art Alley and, yeah. and then the, the musical things like Open Mic Night. But what else is there? Where, where can, if I'm a new person into town and, and someone says, hey, talk to Travis Hensey, he's kind of your go-to guy for the arts. What, what do you say? Wow, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> you know my name already. <laughs> yeah, I just moved here. <laughs> What do I say? I would probably, man, what would I tell them? Maybe what I just said. Hard alley yeah. and open mic. Tonight. Somehow people find open mic. So it's on the radio and people show up there. Mm -hmm. In our alley, we're trying to make it a place that people can find anyway. I, I guess when I think about making Shatter in the arts community that I want, and this may be a total cop out. I just want to be behind the scenes. Like when it comes to our alley, I really, really am happy with Gabby Mikna taking everything over. I, she's a wonderful face, great with people. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be the guy making things happen in the background. So when they come to me, I would probably have the same blank stare like when you just ask me, <laughs> hypothetically. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see uh, to help grow the arts scene in Shadron? What's next for us as a town? It would be nice if we could keep the art alley going. It's kind of hitting some rocks right now. Okay. It's getting some paintings approved and finding the space to make that happen. So it'd be great if we could get more community um, buy-in on that, especially because every, everything, everything is volunteer, the time materials, everything. Yeah. Um, I would also like to see ripping off that Fort Hayes thing and letting businesses display work. And I, would, I especially the college, like yeah. we have this, what they call the 10th, 10th street wall that separates the college campus from town. It'd be great if we could figure out a way to get those artists work out in town. Mm -hmm. um, even more so than my high school students. I'm, I think that the college students artwork should probably take some priority over that and being displayed because they are already making the effort to be professional. And I think we need to give them opportunities for that. Oh, sure. That. It couldn't hurt. Because if you're not into the arts, you're very unlikely to go to Memorial Hall and mm -hmm. visit the gallery. And even if you are, you're probably not going to make it like I am. And I have to make a very conscious effort to go there. 
Um, but if it, it was out in the town, whether in murals or just in businesses where it could be displayed, that would be nice to see. Yeah, if you're mm -hmm. in for a, an eye appointment and you see some really yeah. interesting landscapes painted on the that are on, hung on the wall, that'd be great. Yeah. I, in, That's a good idea. So Grand Visions, I would also like to start up like an arts council where it's artists getting together and making things and maybe a space where they could do that, a shared space where they could do that. I really miss college and that community of critiquing, like Daniel and I went to art school together and just being able to see each other in Memorial Hall and talk and bounce ideas off each other is really valuable. Mm -hmm. I think I made some of my, maybe not best work, but I was definitely more productive than ever then because you just had to be and you had ideas to bounce off. There's a little bit of a competitive element going on there. And so if there was a way the community could create that, because there's a lot of people that make art and do creative work around here. And if we could, get a group going that's organized, that'd be great. And I, I like the idea of it being, a, it's cross media. It's yeah. not just a photographer's club or a sculptor's club. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, you know, you and I work in very different media and, and it, it is great to see what what's, what's going on in that area that's completely outside of mine, but yeah. what inspiration can I take from that? And do you remember Scott Roberts? Yeah. He was in the theater department. He just moved back and that man is wild and he, just got into making his own musical instruments and he every single day he's making something that I've never seen before and that has me very anxious because I'm not making anything and he's out there just cranking it out and so now I feel like I have that energy yeah. again if I could expand that and have like a weekly or monthly meeting where people get together and just show what they're working on that'd be fun yeah oh definitely so are you buying in you I'm buying in okay. yeah let's do it <laughs> and all it can't hurt yeah um, so I think, let's say that, uh, excellent discussion though. Yeah. So we got some quick hitters for you, quick questions. Yeah. Uh, a, a favorite creator, whether in the music world or the art world? Favorite creator. One of, yeah, not, not necessarily the absolute favorite, but yeah. Linda Berry. Um, she's a comic book artist. She's also a teacher. She just won the MacArthur Genius Award. Okay. Talking nice. about flare pens. She is all about flare pens and, <laughs> nice. and cheap composition notebooks. Um, I rip off her lessons all the time because they're really good at just getting people to make marks on a page and then tell a story with them. Um, so I would say definitely Linda Berry, check her out. She's really funny comics. If you're a teacher, she has some great work that you can use if you're trying to break people out of a structure that they're feeling in. Like, I'm not creative is a common thing I hear all the time. Well, we, I don't care. Just we can get you there anyway, mm -hmm. you know? I like that. That I, It sounds like that idea of just getting something on the page because yeah. I know if I'm, I'm going to try and doodle. I want to doodle something. What am I going to doodle? Yeah. Yeah, you overthink I got it. nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Travis, what about a favorite art movement? Art Nouveau. and. Um, Going to go with Art Nouveau and just tying in the arts and craft because they're kind of the same thing. Um, bringing, bringing back the artisan and the craftsman as something that's special and, and the thing, like talking about the lamp, that that was a handmade thing. That you, when you look at it, you know that it was made by someone with some skill and talent and time was put into it. Um, and I think that might be just a, my own reaction against mass market commodities and stuff, you know. I'm trying to shop for a house right now and I, I have to break my idealism when I go in there and cause I, you know, I just see laminate countertops and I should be okay with it, but I'm not because I'm an artist and I, you know, I want these things and I can't afford them. But so I think the arts and crafts movement and art nouveau, just bringing back the value of that person, that maker. Right. Yeah. First concert you attended or maybe first concert you played. I think that, your uh, choice. First concert I played, if we ignore, like, first grade Christmas program. Yeah, those don't, <laughs> yeah, those don't count. Those don't count. Uh, it would have to be the 15 years old Earth Day with Sean Marie at the Courthouse yeah. Gazebo. First show I attended was Newfound Glory back in the Blink-182 days in Rapid City at the Rushmore uh, Civic Center, whatever they call it. I was kind of out of the pop punk and newfound glory scene when I went to that show, but I loved it anyway. Um, and they had Reggie in the full effect, which were kind of a meme of the poppy punk scene. They 
sprayed fake blood out of a toy fire truck and had weird costumes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was really fun. It was my first mosh pit ever, and it was really packed, and I was way too small to be packed into a mosh pit. And I had... I thought I was really cool and goth back then, and I wore multiple belts, you know, one to hold my pants up and one to look cool. Right. And this guy in front of me had one of those um, carabiner belt clips for his keys, and his carabiner got locked on to my <laughs> belt buckle, and so we were attached, and we're in the middle of a mosh pit trying to detach each other. <laughs> well, covered in, you know, fake blood sprayed from the stage, so. Oh, what a great memory. Then, yeah, that's what it's memory. all about. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Probably a lot of chain wallets flying around. I did not then, have a chain uh, wallet, but okay. there were flying around, yeah. <laughs> those are the dangerous parts yeah. of the mosh pit, chain wallets. you got to watch out for those. Dangerous yeah. fun. Ugh, mm. Dangerous. <laughs> Reggie and the Full Effect, though. I've always thought that was a great name for a band. Yeah. Songs about like Loch Ness Monster falling in love or they're getting divorced or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Travis, if you had to choose one. Mm -hmm. Graphite or charcoal? Graphite. Yeah. Uh, tell us why. It's a texture thing. Okay. The feeling of charcoal on paper uh, just kind of grinds my gears, and it does my students too, and so on. I can see that. And, but there's certain qualities that you can't get with anything else but charcoal, and so when I have to teach it, me and my students with those textural sensitivities, we just have to fight through it. Mm -hmm. You can't get a black as fast with anything else but like charcoal. Yeah. Uh Hard or soft lead, then? I started really loving hard pencils, like starting with the 3H when I would prepare a drawing. But I've softened up, and I might even go in with a 3B now. Okay. I, I think I, I just missed that blackness that I couldn't get with charcoal, but I wouldn't ever touch the charcoal. <laughs> yeah. but I love the sheen that a charcoal yeah. drawing will put on there. You know, in the light, it just has that, catches the light. More mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good stuff. Uh, how many times have you been up to the top of Sea Hill? Countless times, I suppose. I, Thousands. Yeah. Um, I don't do it very much anymore, but I used to always like walk every single day, and it would be part of my route. Yeah. And, of course, you've been through pre-2006 wildfire yeah. post. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I find it's it's tougher to get up there now, you know, third years on from then or however long it's been. Yeah. In elementary school, you could count on at least once a year, your PE teacher, Mr. English, he'd run you up and just the whole class would run up um, yeah. the hill where King's Chair is. And then you'd, you know, wander on the hill and then walk down Sea Hill. And you could get lost in the trees. Yeah. There were so many oh, trees. Yeah. You could get lost up there. Now there's no yeah, getting lost. Nothing. You just look around and you know where you are. <laughs> it kind of feels like a different world because I have yeah. those memories of, of – um, uh, when it had trees up there and yeah. exactly that, you could get lost. Well, well one day in the future. That's right. Hopefully. 200 years. Or what did Lucinda say? 50 <laughs> yeah, years or 100 years? We just talked to Lucinda. 1% of the trees she planted up there were- Which was a good number. Root. Yep. The, the number she was thrilled about, though. That's a good so, number? Yeah. Oh, wow. Out of like the- was it 2,000 or 20,000 that we- that all, uh, It's definitely- I thought everybody it was planted. multiple thousands. Yeah. Yeah. So you get, heck, 1% out of that. Yeah, it's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're all about the trees on Sea Hill. Yep, we, for yeah. sure. More the better. Well, I think we've, we've come to the end of it, Travis. And thanks so much for coming in. I really appreciate talking to you every time I get, get a chance to see you. And um, hope you had a good time, too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah thanks, Travis.